Firstly, welcome to uh, the webinar for the Low Emissions Freight and Logistics Trial. My name's Andy Eastlake. Uh, I, I, I do have my camera on, so you can probably see me down in the corner. Um, I'm Managing Director of the uh, Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, uh, and we're very pleased to host this uh, first public dissemination of the results from the uh, uh, LEFT program, Low Emissions Freight and Logistics Trial. Uh, just for anyone who isn't aware, there is a, uh, a, a, a sister um, uh, webinar next week at the same time uh, to pick up the other half of the programs that have been running. So um, this uh, first webinar is all about the, uh, the technologies for the long haul and gaseous fuel activity. Uh, I'm also very pleased that we've got uh, the projects uh, alongside us uh, virtually uh, to present their outputs as well. A few key housekeeping things uh, as, as people accumulate. If we uh, just uh, head on to the next slide. <clears throat> um, a couple of first things, uh, we're hosting this in Microsoft Teams. It should be able to cope with uh, all of the people we're expecting. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, hopefully you can see the control bar that's on the slide there. Um, we will try to keep people muted uh, for the bulk of the uh, the event and then open up the opportunity to unmute and ask questions uh, at specific points after each of the presentations. So we do want to get some feedback, uh, particularly uh, points of clarification, but also importantly, um, some key pointers on how to present this. Um, uh, we will also, but uh, I know for some people that uh, the chat function is, is the best way to raise questions, but we will open up the mics as well. Uh, the other option is to raise your hand, which hopefully you can see there. There's a little icon to click and raise your hand. And between my team, the three or four of us online, we'll try to uh, keep an eye on that and uh, make sure we, we do bounce over to people. I suspect we may not have enough time for all of the questions. So if there are other aspects, uh, please feel free to email one of the team. My email is there on the, uh, um, on the slide. Uh, and we'll certainly try and capture all of the questions to take forward. Um, uh, underneath the uh, the program and uh, and into the uh, into the out outputs from this uh, this webinar. Uh, the last point I want to raise is uh, that we are recording this webinar. So if anyone is not supposed to be here or is told their boss they're somewhere else, uh, now is probably a good time to uh, to drop out because uh, we will be recording this uh, and making the uh, it's a public event, so it's uh, it's not low CVP members only. It's open to uh, anyone who registered. Uh, so we will be making that uh, recording available. Uh, and the slides from this this event and next week's event will be used as the basis for a formal public facing report on this program, which we're expecting in September. Um, just moving on, um, the agenda for today, uh, a quick overview and uh, an introduction from myself, and then we will uh, head into the four presentations. Uh, those will be split up from each of the projects. We'll get the projects to present their overall uh, views and impressions from the, uh, the program of work. Uh, we've also got Brian uh, from my team will be presenting uh, the summary of the independent emissions testing that all projects uh, were subject to, uh, to actually bring all of the, the technologies onto one sort of common basis. Uh, and those will give us uh, a, another added piece of uh, data for this program. Uh, and then we will have a comfort break in the middle. Uh, and then we'll also have a couple of uh, sessions of open discussion uh, really, we want to take from this, what are the key headline messages that we want to uh, bring together and put into the, uh, into the government quite strongly, uh, both and, and to then publicise more widely uh, in the public report. Uh, and importantly, uh, we do want to learn from this project uh, any key lessons regarding future trial design. As I think everyone's aware, uh, there's a big focus on transport decarbonisation. Government are absolutely in listening mode right now in terms of ideas, opportunities, uh, and we're involved in a number of activities, as indeed I know are lots of you around the, uh, the virtual table. Um, so this is a great opportunity to pick out some really key messages and positive learnings from this programme and to take those forward into future policy and technology evaluation. Um, and then we'll have a final, uh, final summary. 
Uh, we aim to close at three o'clock. Uh, Brian and myself are available after that, but we will aim to close the proceedings at three o'clock because uh, two hours is more than enough online uh, from, from uh, my experience. Um, moving on, I just wanted to just sort of set the scene very, very fleetingly. Um, hopefully people are aware, but uh, transport from the latest Bayes figures published uh, um, last month is now 34% of the UK greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So it is the biggest sector. Uh, it's one of the few sectors that isn't declining at, the, uh, at, at a, a fast enough rate to meet anything like our net zero targets. So there is absolutely a key focus on the decarbonisation of transport. This webinar and all of this programme and the, the left project over the last three years has been focused on that area circled, the HGV and van sector, which as you can see from that comparison between 1990 and 2018, this chart is taken from the uh, decarbonising transport uh, strategy document published in March. Those sectors, HGVs and vans, are a growing proportion of the challenge we face. Uh, it's also fair to say we have some clear uh, activities and targets emerging for cars and taxis, but the uh, the future is less clear for the HGV sector, of course. Um, so it is absolutely a key focus. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, what I do want to do is to just uh, introduce and online, I think we have representatives from uh, all of the, uh, the supporting and funding and monitoring partners. Uh, this program of work has been a, a significant uh, activity, about 20 million uh, over three years, uh, starting in 2017. Uh, there were, uh, th there's been eight projects we're reporting on here that have made it all the way through the process and delivered some really, really good outcomes. Um, the program was funded under, under Innovate or through Innovate by the Office for Low Emission Vehicles, so uh, our thanks go to both of those uh, organisations. The monitoring activity uh, that we're reporting on today was led over the three years by TRL, who, who oversaw an independent monitoring of the in-service data and also oversaw the emissions testing program that Low CVP were very closely involved in, uh, the independent emissions testing. Uh, Low CVP are sat here uh, hosting these webinars, but I know TRL are online, Innovator online, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure Olev are online as well. Uh, and so all of those um, those parties are available if there are specific questions. Um, I think it's important to flag up that the projects themselves monitored the vehicles in service uh, and analysed their own data. And a lot of that data that you'll see today is directly from the project's own activities. Most of those were consortia between typically fleet operators, technology providers, fuel providers, uh, and indeed academic partners within this. Uh, and we felt it was very important for the project to have the chance to present their findings and learnings uh, and to really highlight the benefits that they, they've seen from this programme as part of this activity. So we are interspersing our um, low CVP TRL independent data together with the projects throughout the programme today. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say at this point. I think um, now it's probably best if we jump straight into the projects. After each project, uh, we'll have an opportunity for a few questions. Uh, but I'd like to hand over to Daniel Lambert now from uh, Air Liquide uh, to lead us off with the first project, which is uh, entitled Dedicated to Gas uh, and focuses on some uh, um, LNG and CNG technology in the heavy duty sector. Uh, thank you, Daniel. I'll hand over to you now. Great, thanks Andy. Can everyone hear me right? Yeah. Great. So just to give you a bit of context to this, this trial, so we put forward our application in uh, mid-2016. Um, at that time, the situation was rather different to now. Uh, we'd come out of the back of the low carbon truck trial, so there's plenty of data about the, the type of gas trucks that were available then. Um, there are about 500 of those gas trucks on the road then but they were a completely different type of gas truck to what, what is uh, on the roads now and what we wanted to trial in this, this project. So the, the uh, predominant type of truck then was dual fuel gas truck, uh, a, a dual fuel retrofit. So uh, aftermarket retrofits had been the status quo in the UK. 
um, the low carbon truck trial and other tests, including those undertaken by low CVP, that highlighted in particular methane slip as an issue with those type of trucks. And um, I would say from the experience of Air Liquide and our customers, uh, the operability and reliability of those dual fuel vehicles was, was an issue, um, especially as some of the companies that had done the retrofits uh, had ceased to exist um, in the UK. So, but it didn't all look gloomy then. The hypothesis was that the next generation of Euro 6 gas trucks would solve a lot of those issues. And when combined with the increasing biomethane production in the UK, uh, we felt that they would provide the best immediate solution to decarbonizing the heavy uh, part of the UK transport uh, and freight logistics sector. So basically, we highlighted three main questions. Um, we wanted to see how the dedicated Euro 6 gas trucks performed in terms of uh, the engine performance, reliability, fuel economy, what the environmental benefits would be compared to diesels uh, when running on fossil gas and biomethane with a particular emphasis on biomethane, I would say, through this project, and what the commercial opportunities would be. Because if, if there aren't commercial opportunities, no, one, no one's going to use them anyway. So we put together um, a group of, uh, a core group of partners. So Eliki took the lead um, on this project, and we brought in several vehicle operators. So Howard Tenens, Asda, Kuna Nagel, been uh, with us throughout the project. And I'd like to mention also um, Wynne Canton and uh, Brit European, who were in the consortium at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to deploy the trial trucks that they'd expected to. I'll, I'll come on to that later. Um, but this is the nature of the challenge of these type of projects. Um, but we did trial a broad range of uh, different dedicated gas vehicles, um, and we were very satisfied with the outcome of this project. In terms of technical experts, so Senex gathered uh, the data, the in-service data for our project and analyzed it and prepared a report, which you can find on their website for the ded dedicated to gas project. Um, emissions analytics did PEMS testing on the vehicles. So the aim was to provide uh, emissions testing and in-service data that reflected real world conditions as much as possible. So the portable emissions measurement system uh, testing was very important to that and microlyze fitted telematics equipment to all of the vehicles uh, so that we could gather quite granular data on, on the operations. Um, although Iveco, Scania and Volvo weren't actually project partners, I put them here because they were very involved right from the beginning when we put in the application and it wouldn't have, have worked without their, their close cooperation and help. In terms of the vehicle types deployed, uh, so quite a large range um, so the project kicked off early back in kind of mid 2017. We had our first vehicles on the road, the Scania's. Um, by the time we reached the end of the trial, actually the Scania next generation truck was available. So we managed to squeeze that in to the trial. Um, we also trialed three types of Iveco vehicles uh, and two configurations of the Volvo HPDI. Just to mention here, um, the, the main difference between the vehicles, the Iveco and Scania trucks are spark ignition gas trucks. So 100% gas, whether it's CNG or LNG, and the Volvo vehicles uh, use the compression ignition system, so high pressure direct injection. Uh, as I said before, particular focus on the heavy end, so 26 tonnes was the lightest vehicle. Uh, most of them were more towards the kind of 40, 44 tonne end, and generally long haul and regional duty cycles. And the refueling uh, infrastructure that we used, a mixture of on depot, so for instance, how tenants have their own CNG station, uh, LNG stations operated by Air Liquide at Wellingborough and Bristol. And then uh, we also used CNG fuel station in Crew. So thanks for that. Next slide, please. Um, kind of the overview of this project. So the, a lot of these types of vehicles were the first, uh, first deployment of these types of vehicle actually. So it was great to get them on the road in this trial and immediately get the data that, that we needed. Um, and that's been very important to growing the market and, and proving the case for these types of Euro 6 vehicles as being very different to the dual fuel retrofits that existed before. Um, first UK trial run on 100% biomethane, um, and that's also been the case. CNG Fuels trial, I believe, is on 100% biomethane. So it's great to see the, the biomethane providing the, kind of the basis of these uh, trial results um, emissions analytics developed a new emissions testing protocol in line with low CVP guidelines. 
and we were able to uh, do three real world PEMS testing sessions at Brunting Fort under both cycles, in addition to the, uh, the trials which were done at Millbrook, the PEMS and Dino testing uh, done by um, low CVP and TRL at Millbrook. We also did a couple of sessions of dynamometer testing, which focused in particular on filling in the little gaps of, uh, that hadn't been tested before. So n testing, it's the first time that that had been done. Um, that was especially important uh, in relation to the HPDI Volvo uh, equipment. And another point, so the biomethane being so important to this trial, uh, we actually developed a new way of supplying that. So we did the first supply of biomethane mass balanced with LNG from the importation terminal at the Isle of Grey, which has been really crucial. Uh, it's set a precedent, which is, and it's now been adopted by DFT as the standard at the beginning of 2019. So that's really helped a lot more biomethane flow into um, heavy goods vehicles powered on gas than would otherwise have been the case. Um, quite a few other things, but I know we're short on time, so let's go to the next slide. So just in terms of the, uh, the, the in-service data, um, you can see the different things we collected there, a range of things. And for most vehicles, they were running for at least 12 months, um, some for, for basically the whole two years. Uh, the early uh, early entries. Um, the Volvo trucks and the Scania Next Generation came in near the end of trial, so we got nine months of trial data, in-service data through the dedicated gas project. Actually, all the project partners carried on working on this project free of charge, basically without funding, for free, at least three months afterwards. So the data that will go into the TRL and low CVP report uh, will have um, minimum 12 months trial data as well. And in terms of the comparability of the left vehicles and diesels, um, basically it was very important for us to try and compare equivalents. So as much as possible, we uh, deployed similar power rating of trucks, similar Euro standard, same kind of weights, operations and routes, etc. So next slide, please. Um, as you would expect, so this, this shows um, amalgamated across the different uh, different duty cycles that we trialed these trucks on for each of the vehicle types, the difference in the um, the, the, the efficiency of the engine uh, for the gas versus the vehicle, the, the diesels, and the difference in range. So um, basically you have for the spark ignition vehicles, you have overall uh, a significant efficiency drop compared with the diesel engines, which is what you would expect for spark ignition. Uh, versus the compression diesel engines. For the Volvo truck, the one at the bottom, the um, compression ignition Arctic, that efficiency drop is much lower, again, as you'd expect, because you're comparing apples to apples there with two compression type engines. In terms of the, the range difference, um, mostly you can fit less energy on the gas truck than you can on the diesel truck, so uh, the range will be less, um, except in the case of the the LNG Arctic, where you can carry LN big LNG tanks on both sides and basically get more range. Um, I won't go into the details here, but they, all of this information can be found in Senex's report. If you're interested, go to their website and you can download the report, which will give you more detail. So next slide, please. In terms of the, um, this is the in-service results. So the well-to-wheel -well greenhouse gas emission savings. Um, the data here comes from the refueling logs for the spark ignition engines and the uh, telemetry data for the compression ignition engines. And this shows the greenhouse gas savings aggregated across all the duty cycles. So what I should mention here is that this includes, it's amalgamated across the urban, uh, regional, long haul duty cycles. So, um, and, if you could move on to the next slide and then come back to this one, then I can explain how that works in more detail. So the graphs, the graph here shows a summary of the emissions test results for all the types of tests and vehicles. So these are the emissions tests undertaken by the dedicated to gas project itself. So Brian is going to take you through the low CVP and TRL emissions tests separately in a moment. But basically the data collected from the in-service trial, as per the previous slide, has been added to this graph via those red diamonds that you can see to compare the results from the tests in controlled conditions to those of the variable nature of day-to-day -day operation of the vehicles. Um, 
what you can see here is the uh, the miles per gallon equivalent difference basically tends to decrease when you're moving from urban to motorway cycles, um, and therefore the, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions are reducing as in general as you move from the urban through to the motorway duty cycles. So we see this as a positive outcome as rural and motorway drive cycles represent 88% of the difference covered by UK HGV fleets, uh, as well as the specific operations in this trial. So basically for the operations in this trial, um, we would tend to interpret these as, as giving us uh, uh, emission savings along the line of the motorway um, results in, in this graph. So natural gas provides emission savings versus diesel in six out of eight of these trial tests. Um, and you should note that this is, this is using a 0% bio blend. So this is running on just natural gas alone. If you go back to the previous slide, then this table at the bottom shows you aggregated across these different duty cycles at 0%, so basically fossil natural gas, that's the top row, anything below that. So once you're getting up to 25% of biomethane blend, then you can expect kind of 20 to 30% CO2E savings. Um, once you're getting up to 100% bio blend, then it's kind of 70 to 80% CO2E savings. So very significant savings for 100% bio, which was what, what we were running in this trial. But as, as I said at the, out, at the beginning, it, it's very important for us to see what the actual impacts were just for natural gas as well versus diesel. So if you skip a couple of slides, then I think we're handing over to Brian now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Daniel. So I'm going to, um, we're just doing a bit of a double act. So I'll, I'll uh, dip in partway through the presentations and then Daniel will come back to, um, uh, to, to finish off. Um, so covering the uh, independent emissions testing uh, done at Millbrook, um, uh, organised by uh, TRL, uh, with, as Annie said, a lot of uh, support and help and guidance uh, from low CVP uh, on behalf of Innovate UK, the overall uh, funders. Uh, so within this um, project, as Daniel says, there were um, various different technologies combining LNG and CNG. Uh, CNG vehicles were tested actually as part of the uh, the next project, the CNG fuels project. So I'll come on to the CNG results uh, a little bit later. Uh, but for now, on the two LNG technologies, so both the spark ignition dedicated gas and the compression ignition, uh, it, it's known as a, a dual fuel. So it is, there is a little bit of diesel use uh, in order to ignite uh, the gas. Um, but unlike the um, the previous generation of dual fuel gas vehicles that uh, uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, this vehicle will not run in diesel only mode. So it does, in, in that sense, it's a, it's a full dedicated gas vehicle to some extent. Uh, testing, uh, two types of testing really, uh, on a chassis dyno, so indoors, very highly uh, regulated, controlled conditions, uh, able to measure at very high accuracy all the uh, emission species coming out of, of the vehicle. Uh, that was done at uh, 20 tonnes because that was the maximum capability of, of Millbrook's facility at the time. Um, a new facility is about to be commissioned, but um, uh, at the time of these trials, 20 tonnes was our limit. Um, and in order to get more representative payload testing, where vehicles at 20 tonnes was, was represent a very light payload, uh, there is also uh, track track testing done on the, on the Millbrook test track, again under very highly controlled conditions, so very uh, high degree of repeatability from one run to, to another. Um, and we cover the full range of uh, operating cycles from congested city centre type operations through to motorway running, uh, long haul, steady speed uh, on the speed limit and type uh, operations. Uh, I'm going to focus here on the 60% payload results where they where they're available. They, they kind of take priority as they will be the most representative of um, a typical UK operation. So where I've got a choice, I'll, I'll focus on those. Um, uh, clearly, uh, we can't compare a dedicated gas vehicle with it, it itself as a as a, its own diesel comparator. Um, so we we use different vehicles as um, the standard comparators, but we're matching as closely as possible in terms of payloads, um, power outputs, uh, and and so forth. Um, and as mentioned, CNG vehicles are covered by other trials, so I won't talk about those um, here. Now you'll you'll get used to this uh, format of this these these slides as I as I go through the various projects. Um, essentially, the, the key things to look out for are um, for firstly the colour coding, perhaps. So um, uh, let's start from here. So grey means that um, actually there's not a lot of difference between the left vehicle and the diesel comparator. They're within plus or minus 2% of 
on either an energy or a fuel consumption or a, uh, a greenhouse gas emissions uh, perspective or indeed air quality pollutant emissions uh, they're within a, a small margin of error of each other. Um, orange is where the gas vehicle or in this case the gas vehicle but the left vehicle in general uh, is, me is measured to be um, slightly worse or, or higher emissions uh, or in this case higher energy consumption uh, than the left uh, than the diesel comparator vehicle. Um, so this is the energy efficiency loss showing up from going from um, compression ignition to spark ignition uh, and the trend here is clearly it gets worse as the speed goes down. Uh, so in the dyno there is because on this, this particular vehicle uh, Milbrook weren't able to complete testing in time on the track on the city centre cycle so I've defaulted to the dyno results for this particular vehicle on that particular cycle. Uh, but the trend trend is quite clear, um, the lower the speed, the more the energy penalty. Um, whereas for the dual fuel LNG, because it uses the same uh, much higher efficiency diesel compression ignition cycle, um, it does what it says on the tin uh, from our results in that that energy penalty disappears uh, and actually becomes a small, potentially a small energy benefit um, at uh, across all the cycles. So even at the city centre, whilst the, the general pattern is still uh, much better at long haul, not so good at city centre. Um, obviously the differences are much smaller and even city centre there's no um, clear uh, penalty. Um, so here this box will, will show you the sort of a key what we think are the key headline pieces of information derived from, from the, these sets of data over here uh, and in the big blue green box at the bottom are the kind of key positive outcomes we think from, from this aspect of the emissions testing. So in this case you can get up to 10% energy savings with the dual fuel uh, technology, 7% uh, here. I haven't shown the dyno results, but I think the maximum figure on the dyno was was 9%. Um, so around about 10%, I think is a reasonable kind of uh, average to aim at. Uh, and of course, key message here across both of these technologies, uh, long haul is best uh, for these vehicles. These, these are much better suited from an energy point of view to long haul operations, steady speed, high speed running um, than the much more transient uh, low speed stuff. Uh, now, translating that into greenhouse gas emissions, we've done this in, in two ways. Um, firstly, to focus on what's actually coming out of the vehicle itself. So these are the tailpipe emissions, again, using the same sort of colour coding. Green is better than diesel, orange is not as good as diesel, and grey is about the same. Um, uh, but also then using uh, standard factors. So these are the sorts of factors you would have to use if you're uh, going down a company reporting route as the default factors for energy sources in the UK. So there is a default factor for, in this case, gas based on natural gas. That is the, the, the standard kind of default option. Uh, similarly for electricity, it's standard grid average electricity is the, is the factor that's published each year and updated each year uh, by uh, DEFRA, Bayes uh, government in, in, in general. So we're using the standard factors to try and give as best as possible a light for light comparison across the different um, technologies as far as we can. Um, uh, again, even using this standard factor, which is based on fossil LNG, in the long haul cycle, you get quite good savings. Um, that Those savings disappear in the case of the spark ignition, HGV, because of the energy efficiency penalty kind of then dominates, even though the fuel itself, the CNG, is inherently lower carbon, slightly uh, less greenhouse gas impacts than diesel fuel. Um, but uh, as with the previous slide for the dual fuel vehicle, um, because there isn't an energy efficiency loss, um, you get a well-to-wheel -well saving, albeit um, quite quite small, uh, across all the different cycles. Um, but crucially, of course, uh, the standard factors may not be entirely appropriate, not just for these individual trials, but may not be appropriate in um, uh, more general transport applications. Um, clearly, lots of the trials uh, are using other sources of fuel that don't rely on um, grid standard natural gas in this case. Um, so we've also done some calculations. Um, if there were standard factors uh, for uh, sort of renewably sourced versions of these energy sources, then what effect would that have? Uh, and in this case, not surprisingly, uh, and in line with what Daniel was saying earlier from the, from the trials, those um, minus 16 to plus 14 kind of ranges will um, turn into kind of 70% or so um, greenhouse gas overall well-to-wheel savings. Uh, and that is true also for the dual fuel uh, vehicle. Um, although this is inherently more energy, energy efficient, um, what you gain on the roundabouts from energy efficiency, you to some extent lose on the swings uh, because of the diesel use. So there is a little bit of diesel use uh, 
um, from this vehicle um, and we haven't factored in any kind of um, biodiesel or HVO use so this is still pump average diesel we're assuming um, so you end up with about the same kind of 70 percent uh, and also as um, uh, Daniel alludes to uh, one of the key issues um, with previous generations of gas fuels, methane slip. Um, all indications are that um, uh, these uh, OEM you know, certified vehicles uh, do not have that that problem. Uh, kind of measured amounts of methane uh, kind of contribute less than two percent uh, to the overall greenhouse gas impacts. So, uh, big positive messages: seventy percent greenhouse savings uh, with uh, biomethane. Uh, are achievable, but even with fossil energy, 15% uh, is, is not unre unrealistic. Uh, and finally, the pollutant emissions. So this is the air quality stuff, uh, not of such direct interest in kind of long haul applications, but clearly uh, any vehicle can spend some of its time in, in a city centre or in, in, in uh, low speed urban centres. So uh, air quality is not, not to be ignored. Um, more of a mixture of greens and oranges here. Um, but overall, so the overall message is there's not really a lot lot to choose. It's a bit horses for courses. Um, so the old adage, uh, which probably was true in Euro 5 days, that a gas vehicle will be cleaner uh, in terms of air quality pollutant emissions than a, than a diesel vehicle, um, yeah, isn't true in, in, a, in a Euro 6 world. Um, but there's nothing here to, um, to alarm us uh, in terms of all these numbers are, uh, whether it's from the left vehicle or the diesel vehicle, they're all in a similar sort of range, you know, uh, the range we see typically uh, for for the, the bog standard diesel Euro 6 vehicles. Uh, that, that figure there is quite high, but it's you know, it's on the dyno, so a very light load. That's the kind of the most extreme operating condition for a, for a diesel vehicle. Very difficult to keep the SCR system uh, sufficiently warm to, uh, to be effective. So that is a slightly high figure. Um, but again, it's still a, a lot better than um, a Euro 5 vehicle would have would have been. Um, so again, little, little shoes, and, and this here um, explains. Uh, and this the other CO here is carbon monoxide. So I've focused on NOx and particulate number as being the two most important um, pollutant emissions we're, we're focused on. Um, but uh, typically, uh, one of the um, overall conclusions from this is, as I say, horses for courses, where you get a benefit in one area, you do tend to get this benefits popping up somewhere else. Uh, and, and and in this case, and to some extent on this one as well. One of those disbenefits is, is carbon monoxide emissions going up as you move from the diesel vehicle to the left vehicle. Uh, and that's it for me on that one. So back to Daniel to, to finish things off for this project. Okay. I'll keep it brief. Yeah, so sorry. The, I think the main the main things um can run the can hear my voice please. Uh, we can hear you a little bit um is that any better? Yeah, oh, that's good. So, so basically, we also looked at we did um, driver questionnaires. We looked at the um, reliability and maintenance issues of the vehicles. So the results from those were all positive for, uh, across the trials. Um, what one main barrier, or, well, two main barriers really. The methane slip one was a big issue at the outset of the trial, and we really feel that as as Brian reiterated, that that's been um, solved by this trial. Um, and other trials. And in terms of the government policy support, a big step forward was that we were able to get some data to um, DFT in advance of their decision on the extension of fuel duty, duty differential, which, which really helped kind of feed in, into that and um, their decision to extend that fuel duty differential for gas trucks versus diesels um, in, to 2032, which has been a really, really big step, I think, and, and really helped remove kind of long-term uncertainty for potential operators of these gas trucks. Um, let's skip to the next slide. So looking at the business case, um, I mean, it, this really backs up the, the case for the uh, emission savings looking better for higher mileage routes. It's the, the case with the commercial returns as well as you would expect, given the higher upfront cost of the gas vehicles versus diesel vehicles. Um, and uh, we've we've broken this down for the four main vehicle types. So, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, the more mileage you do, uh, the quicker the payback will be, and therefore, the, this reinforces the idea that gas trucks um, provide faster returns on longer mileages versus uh, versus diesels. And if we skip forward to the next one, so. 
lessons learned, um, anyone thinking of doing a project like this, um, I think what the main things that we've learned with project partners, make sure that you know exactly what contract the trucks will be deployed on, not just with which vehicle operator, and make sure that the, the buy-in is very strong on that contract right from the beginning. Um, in order to avoid any delay in case of um, the, the, the contract may go through a retendering process or contract changes over, over the course of uh, the project. Um, work very closely with the OEMs, um, in particular, CAN bus access. So this is one of the things that we, we maybe didn't look at in enough detail before the project started, how we would access the, the data from the OEMs vehicles um, solved in the end, but required quite a lot of work. And then what type of vehicles, I mean, if it's something really innovative and the scheduling is already quite tight, then it's probably probably not going to work out in the end. So the car transporters, for instance, that Brit European wanted to deploy in this project, unfortunately, we just couldn't bring all the pieces together with gas trucks, which are completely new, which would just be deployed in time to meet the schedules and then having to do the body build work around that as well. So that was disappointing, but um, we, we, we filled the gap that with uh, other vehicle types that actually became available in time for us to trial. And last slide. So I think we've had some really positive outcomes. So the three vehicle operators that participated in the trial had took very positive results from this um, before the, the trial had even ended. Asda had ordered more LNG trucks. And um, actually, I didn't mention they, they ordered 20 CNG trucks as well. Um, so off the back of the left trial results and then moving towards the significant rollout of gas HGVs in their fleet. Um, likewise with Kunanagal, they ordered uh, more LNG trucks at the end following positive experience and how attendance with CNG trucks. Um, Air Liquide has um, made the move to quadruple our gas fuel infrastructure compared with where we were at the end of the trial by Q1 next year. And we've been supplying 100% biomethane to all of our UK stations since the beginning of 2019. Um, if you look at the biomethane across the whole gas station network, it reached 80% in 2019, which is, is, is really great news and really backs up the findings of this trial and the expectations that the majority of vehicles could run on 100% biomethane and, and achieve the emissions uh, savings that, that we think are possible. So I'd, I'd just like to say a big thanks to Innovate UK for making this project uh, happen and to Low CVP for their invaluable input throughout the project and for organising this webinar. Thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest in the interest of time, because um, uh, we are a little bit behind already, and that's um, just as much my fault as it is uh, Daniel's or, or anyone else's. Uh, I'm going to suggest we merge the questions for Daniel with the questions from the, the next project, which is CNG Fuels, uh, very similar sorts of technologies. Um, so when you see a slide in a few moments saying questions for Baden, um, we'll treat that as questions for Baden uh, and Daniel, if, if that's all right with everybody. So assuming Baden's around, uh, we'll move swiftly on to the CNG Fuels project. Uh, Baden. I, I am indeed. So we love, we're going to get started straight away. Yeah, excellent. All right. Uh, okay. yeah, so thanks, everyone. Um, it's Baden Gowry Smith. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of CNG Fuels. I assume you can all hear me. Um, I'm going to crack on. Um, uh, our project, uh, thank you, Dan, Daniel, as well, and thank you, Brian. Um, our project was uh, specifically to trial a uh, large, a large-scale deployment of CNG vehicles uh, within a single fleet um, to show that essentially, uh, which was John Lewis' partnership, so that uh, that it, CNG and biomethane was essentially mass deployable as a technology from the perspective of running essentially challenging duty cycles. Um, within a well-established business. Um, and uh, this order, the order we place, uh, the order that John Lewis placed was the uh, single largest order of dedicated gas trucks by any fleet in the UK by quite a significant margin. Um, it was also to demonstrate the uh, capability of gas infrastructure to maintain essentially a, uh, a, a, a very high reliability uh, rate. So we, we, we targeted a 99.95 percent availability throughout the trial period um, uh, in order to supply these vehicles because of course uh, redundancy um, and lack of infrastructure is not something uh, it's not something taken lightly in the context of adoption um, and so uh, so reliability is clearly key um, 
We did this through uh, the addition of, uh, of a piece of, equi of, of uh, equipment um, uh, and uh, equipment at the station level itself, as well as uh, mobile fueling trailers funded by Innovate UK uh, very kindly um, in order to maintain, in, in order to provide that, uh, that capability. Um, and of course, the last piece, which is which was critical, uh, was the securing of sufficient levels of RTFO approved biomethane from waste feedstocks um, to provide essentially an uninterrupted supply to 100% of 100% levels uh, to the John Lewis partnership throughout the trial period of 12. Um, uh, available through uh, the stations uh, at which they trial. Um, so on the overview of the vehicles and technologies, we. Uh, that we trialed about 40 or 45, um, so 45 uh, Scania and Aveco vehicles were purchased. The uh, trial ran actually 12 months for Scania. We were fortunate um, about six months into uh, to secure, uh, about 12 months into secure some new Aveco dedicated vehicles, uh, which we were then able to uh, run initially along a longer trial period for um, against nine diesel baseline Scania vehicles. Uh, we actually trialed both electrical, uh, electric fridge units, uh, TRUs, um, as well as biomethane powered ones um, uh, uh, on them um, to see where that would bring down overall emissions as well um, on the un unregulated emission side. Um, and of course, running on uh, the RTFO uh, approved biomethane again. I'll be quick to this, but uh, total distance traveled more than 7 million kilometers were traveled over 12,211 uh, operational days, uh, average of 577 kilometers per day. Um, and uh, 461 for the diesel vehicles. So clearly, uh, it's a very was we end up with an extremely rich data set um, over a long period uh, across uh, all seasons, so a number of duty cycles, uh, multiple stations, including Le uh, Leyland, uh, Northampton, which became operational during the during the during the trial, um, and very kindly a uh, gas rec station at Durf as well. Um, the yeah distance weight average loads 23 tons um, and. Uh, we were able to supply um, biomethane across both, uh, across essentially both, well, both the CNG fuel stations uh, that we supply um, for, uh, for all of the gas over the 18 month period. Um, so we had 100% supply of biomethane for the 18 months. On to the next slide in service data overview. Uh, so we collected. Um, on our side, the, the refueling data uh, is kilos of CNG average liters of diesel dispensed. Um, uh, mileage traveled uh, was collected uh, by each of the drivers inputting their various data, uh, the, the data at each refueling event. Um, and then at CNG station level, we collected uh, all the maintenance and equipment downtime events were also recorded. Um, comparability to the data, uh, so if we distance um, operational hours uh, speed loads, and then uh, and then uh, and then obviously and then tons tons per kilo um, to, to 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 confirm sufficiently uh, similar operations between the two. So uh, the next slide, the in uh, in service results summary. Um, left vehicles on average consumed uh, 0.25 uh, kilos per kilometer of biomethane, or uh, inversely. Uh, four kilometers per kilo. Uh, baseline diesel vehicles average concerned about 0.25 liters per kilometer of diesel. Um, and uh, as expected, oh, yeah, energy was low in both months, um, but uh, reasonably similar, uh, reasonably similar figures. Um, headline results is really critical, um, as Daniel um, and Brian have uh, already been through. Uh, when using the Bayes and DEFRA factors, uh, we had well to wheel emissions essentially uh well to emission well to wheel emissions greenhouse gas emission savings on biomethane uh, versus diesel of about 81 percent uh much much the same as as has just been presented um and to be clear all of the biome all of the gas distributed dispensed from our stations was 100 percent biomethane um as I want to relate to it it has been uh sustained for present um had the stations run on grid average gas, uh, the savings would have been 5% um, versus baseline diesel vehicles. But the 81% and the 5% have been calculated using Bayes and DEFRA well to wheel factors. Um, there are a number of additional factors which need to be considered um, on the basis of the uh, economic logic behind, uh, behind the, the deployment of CNG stations. 
Um, we, wherever possible, will always deploy, and I and I'm, I would I would struggle with this across uh, infrastructure providers in general. We'll always look to deploy stations at higher pressures for several economic factors, um, uh, as well as the ability for additional utilization, uh, higher flow rates, etc. Um, but uh, for instance, at Leyland, where it's connected to the LTS high pressure grid, um, the uh, levels of essentially reduced gas leakage uh, from the pipeline can lead to uh, quite different results. Um, these were analyzed uh, not by, uh, by Element Energy uh, in a study not, uh, not, <laughs> not, uh, not led by us. Um, uh, and back in 2018, um, and the uh, th these fa factors that, for instance, a high pressure grid station were found to be 7% lower. So that would increase your well to wheel greenhouse gas emission savings to 88% um, and 12%, 88% and 12% for biomethane or biomethane or grid average gas uh, delivered through those higher pressure networks. Um, I'll now pass over to Brian for his uh, for his slides. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's going to be a bit quicker than only only one technology, uh, but two different uh, two different vehicles, uh, but both uh, CNG smart ignition vehicles. Uh, I think one of them was the uh, nominally next generation uh, that I think uh, uh, Daniel alluded to earlier, uh, and one was the, uh, the 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 previous generation, if you like, uh, of uh, CNG smart ignition. Uh, uh, vehicles, uh, same as the LNG vehicles in terms of test cycles, uh, dyno and test track, diff four different cycles, six percent payload. I'll focus on. Uh, that's all the all the same as the as the LNG. Uh, as I mentioned, some of these vehicles were shared amongst uh, both the Elikid and the CNG Fuels project. So uh, one lot of testing uh, to cover uh, both projects in this in this respect. Uh, so these sorts of vehicles were used by both those projects. Um, so a simpler graph because there's only one uh, one technology here, uh, but two lots of numbers to reflect the two the two vehicles tested. Um, they, they weren't both exactly the same gross vehicle weight, so they will have been tested at slightly different overall weights. Uh, hence the, the, the as well as on uh, you know, different days, different ambient conditions and what have you. Um, so hence the uh, the slight variations here in in fuel consumption, uh, but similar in, in orders of magnitude to the sorts of numbers that um, Bain was just referring to from, from the in-service trials in terms of kilograms per 100 kilometres and litres per 100 kilometres for the, the diesel comparators. Uh, translating those into energy on a chemical energy within the fuel basis uh, shows very similar to pattern to what we have with the LNG spark ignition vehicles, as you probably would expect, um, in that the engine itself doesn't care too much whether it's uh, LNG or CNG going, going through it. Um, similar sorts of uh, Good, good energy performance, reasonably good energy performance anyway. It's a small, a small disk benefit perhaps, but not, nothing major in the long haul cycle. Um, getting uh, progressively worse as you get to the much lower speed uh, city centre type operations, um, which is what that says um, and what that says. And so overall, same conclusion as, as before, long haul. If you're going to use these sorts of vehicles from an energy point of view, long haul is where to do it. Uh, these are the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, again, accepting the uh, the issue between there are uh, different. Uh, obviously, these these are when I say standard DEFRA factors. These are so these are the sort of economy wide standard options, which generally means in this case uh, fossil uh, CNG, fossil gas. Uh, there are standard factors in some cases for some biofuels, including biomethane. So um, the other calculations I've done and that uh, Baden was mentioning there are based on those um, other biomethane derived standard factors. Um, so uh, here again, a, a, a similar uh, picture, uh, get generally a good tailpipe performance and, uh, sorry, was that somebody? Was that just an echo? Right, okay, I'll carry on. Um, good tailpipe performance and, and therefore good well-to-wheel performance on, on the long haul, even assuming standard fossil fuel, fossil and CNG in this case, um, getting worse as the speed goes down and the cycle gets more transient. Uh, overall, 80% uh, sorts of numbers that Baden was, was talking about, um, entirely plausible uh, with uh, biomethane across most of these uh, cycles, if not if not all. Um, but even if you can't get hold of uh, biomethane and you're using just uh, standard fossil CNG, uh, accepting this is based on the standard factors, not the modified versions that Baden was talking about, uh, you can still expect um, a 15% uh, saving in the right applications. And by that I mean long haul. 
And similar again to the uh, LNG spark ignition vehicle from a pollutant emissions point of view, uh, we have a, a, a bit of a sea of orange, um, but again, although that means the um, uh, dedicated gas vehicles uh, certainly aren't, as in days of yore, um, uh, noticeably better than uh, equivalent diesel vehicles, um, they're also not really significantly um, uh, worse. These are numbers all entirely within normal kind of ranges of Euro 6 diesel expectations. Um, so overall, nothing to get too alarmed about and little to choose uh, between gas and Euro, uh, diesel Euro 6 vehicles on uh, an air quality pollutant emissions basis. And back to Bain. Baden, you're on. Either you're still muted or you've disappeared. You're absolutely right. I was talking to myself. Okay. Thank you, uh, Brian. Um, I'll thank you again then in that case. Thank you, Brian. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so driver feedback um, has been really positive. Uh, majority of drivers have preferred uh, to drive the uh, CNG vehicles over diesel vehicles. Um, they are quieter, uh, not noticeably quieter, about 50% quieter. Um, they are, uh, they, there are also, uh, we found on the, lo on the longer routes, um, the uh, lower, lower noise and lower vibrations and the drivers have come back feeling, um, feeling significantly better after long shifts, which is a really interesting one. Uh, something we hadn't, um, hadn't expected as feedback. Um, uh, but the, they also really, uh, they've also really enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the principle of being able to drive clean vehicles and being able to talk about um, and feel that they are, are driving a more environmentally friendly vehicle, which is also really um, really encouraging piece of feedback that we've enjoyed uh, receiving. Uh, reliability has been extremely similar. Um, and of course, the primary piece of, it, of uh, feedback that we're receiving uh, far and wide, both, uh, both from John Lewis and from others, is of course there we need to be uh, more infrastructure, which is something uh, we're clearly working on uh, along with uh, several other uh, infrastructure providers to alleviate as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide, lessons learned. Um, we'll run through this pretty quickly. Uh, but the left trial ran, uh, ran, ran, ran very well. Um, it, it was very smooth with our consortium. Um, it's extremely well monitored uh, by the monitor point by uh, Innovate. Um, uh, you know, we, 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 we had completed uh, the full set of uh, Waitrose um, uh, scanning vehicles within the 12 months. Um, and so it was a successful trial. Um, the communication, I think, probably for future trials uh, probably needs to be, I, I think, the the number of, of the number of trials and different uh, technologies led to obviously uh, challenges, uh, just just completely different challenges between the, each project. And I think um, if we were to give feedback on how the uh, trials are able to be coordinated, um, it is certainly challenging to run multiple uh, multiple technologies at the same time and expect everyone to uh, to everyone to sort of wait on the same reporting, etc. So perhaps there's some learnings um, in the future uh, for project coordinators as to how to disseminate or communicate more regularly on a, on a, on a sort of strict basis so that uh, we can understand, we, we, so there is a more of a iterative kind of conversation on what results coming out, what data is relevant, what isn't, how can we look to better improve it? For instance, you know, um, are refueling times comparable if there's different waiting times, if there's ad blue, et cetera. So, you know, there are, there are if there's a conversation going, um, and it's gonna be a two-way conversation, of course, at that, probably would be more valuable. I think that was hampered largely by the number of trial of, of technologies that are on trial. And so maybe that's, um, maybe that's something we can all uh, look, to for, uh, look to for improvement in future, uh, future innovate and government funded projects. So, um, and lastly, um, uh, I apologize for any parts I read through here, I'm sort of uh, debating basis, uh, but these are, Quite key. Um, the exploitation elements, uh, which we're heavily focused on, is how, how you know, how, how do we, um, uh, and how, how as, a, how, as a project partners, have we taken this forward? Uh, John Lewis partnership uh, this year is placed an order for 143 CNG trucks after delivery in quarter four this year. Um, clearly, it's a significant step there, obviously, and committed to converting their entire fleet to biomethane uh, by 2028, which will be 600 plus HGVs. Um, each diesel truck being replaced about 120 tons per year. Um, so that 143 order from this year alone, 17,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 equivalent uh, per year removed. Uh, as previously discussed, um, we have dispensed 100% um, 
RTFO approved biomethane from waste feedstocks since September 2016. Um, and the gas industry, uh, the CNG and LNG refueling industry has followed suit um, and is uh, and it is just um, uh, 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 along those lines. Um, and as a uh, percentage of uh, gas dispense is rapid is on a ex extremely rapid curve up to, uh, up towards uh, up towards the same level. So we are um, a, as an industry are now dispensing a lot more renewable biomethane, obviously saving a lot more uh, carbon uh, per kilo dispensed. Um, uh, we are, uh, as, as our company, uh, as, as CNG, um, are looking to deploy uh, six to ten CNG stations this year, uh, so this, this uh, the, the, the next 12 months. Um, uh, but to, um, uh, we have uh, well formulated plans and development plans to, to, um, to create more than 12,000 trucks worth of capacity over the next three years. Um, so I, and I want to state, and as Brian has articulated this, this what we're really looking at here is the heaviest, is, is, is the long haul heaviest emitting parts, the hardest to decarbonize vehicles um, in the fleet. This is where, where, where the maximum impact of biomethane can be, uh, can benefit the economy and benefit the fleets. So these are the highest mileage vehicles um, in the country. Um, electrons, uh, yeah, demonstrated 80% greenhouse gas savings. Uh, we, uh, from the middle of 2021, from June 2021, late June 2021, the uh, Renewable Energy Directive 2 will be implemented. Um, certain waste feeds, uh, certain feedstocks from waste will uh, be yielding uh, higher than 100% greenhouse gas savings um, because they are so they emit uh, such a high, high, le high level of, of greenhouse gases. Um, and the include these feedstocks, which are abundant, um, and uh, in, in, into your biomethane mix, should allow us, should allow us, should allow uh, us and, and other um, uh, providers uh, and infrastructure operators to uh, biomethane that is that is net zero or better um, in the years ahead. Um, uh, so we'll be able to take our fleets beyond uh, to, to and beyond their net zero targets um, uh, much much more quickly than. Is being anticipated otherwise. Um, and lastly, the industry momentum is, is, is gaining a huge amount of momentum. Demand for transport from biomethane, uh, from waste, um, is, is leading a massive pipeline of investment in new supplies of biomethane. And we are asked the question a lot. It's the same for all alternative fuels. So how do you get the renewable fuel? Um, how are you going to have it in significant quantities? And there's a few parts to note there. One of the parts is, of course, we are really focused on the heaviest, most difficult part of the industry to decarbonize. The biomethane is extremely good at decarbonizing. Um, there is probably a polyfuel future ahead, um, but you know, there's a huge advantage in technology that's already ready um, and being essentially adopted en masse um, and generating savings. Uh, um, and industry to produce that gas is, uh, is following very, very uh, rapidly behind it with some massive projects, both in the UK and the EU. Uh, that I'm sure not just uh, we are speaking to. So um, the answer that 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 uh, that I think is hugely encouraging. That's that's all from me. Great, thanks, Baden. And, and as I said earlier, so this is now we're we're uh, ten or fifteen minutes behind schedule, but hopefully we can uh, we can pick that up as we as we go through. Um, and there will be a bit of time um, if we need to overrun. People who can stay on can, can do so. Um, but if we can take now questions for Baden or Daniel, uh, Andy, I think uh, if you've been monitoring the the chat or the yeah up on things. Absolutely, Brian. Um, I think one of the key questions. Uh, there's an awful lot of chat around. Uh, biomethane factors, renewable fuels, and the impacts of well-to-wheel. -wheel. Um, this was not aimed to be a discussion on the intricacies of the well-to-wheel -wheel factors for biomethane. So I'd like to park those uh, with the with the the comment that it is going to be critical that we develop and we work on the factors for renewable fuels in transport. We'll hear more about that when we come on to Lemco's presentation. I know. Uh, because the renewability of the fuel is is an absolutely critical component, but that's not the primary focus of this program. Uh, one question I would like to raise, Baden, uh, is whether AdBlue was included in the cost, uh, uh, the, the costing savings and things. Uh, obviously, AdBlue is uh, a cost in the diesel vehicles, but the Spark Ignition 
gas vehicles don't require or don't have an SCR and an AdBlue system. They use a, a three-way CAT. So was AdBlue included in your costings? I no, I, I, as, I, I don't believe that AdBlue was in it, in either in the costings nor in the timings uh, for fueling events uh, was included in our, time, in, in, in our project. No. Thanks, Braden. I think that's, um, yeah, yeah. We, we'll, we'll look into that because it's an area that we've been looking at as well. Uh, but I don't have, I'm afraid I don't have a footprint for AdBlue. Uh, that's one of the questions. And uh, I can't confirm whether it is or in, isn't in the costings on some of these programs, but we'll, we'll look into that. Uh, are there any other um, key questions we want to raise right now uh, as anyone want to flag up before we uh, probably take a comfort break and then actually pick up the other two projects directly after that, I think might be the easiest thing. Okay. Any other key questions people want to raise? As I say, we'll, we'll pick up some of the commentary around the uh, well-to-wheel factors. Uh, there's some really good points being made about clarity and, uh, and importance. Um, do we want to, to go straight on uh, or do we want to uh, just take uh, a couple of minutes uh, and um, uh, I'll, I'll monitor the chat. So if there's any other key chat questions uh, and then we'll come back uh, and, and get straight in with um, the Lawrence David uh, aero trailer and lightweight trailer in uh, at, at uh, five minutes past uh, two, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, David Seaborn, if you're on, since um, this is the time when we have to, we're handing over screen share to you. If you if you hold on for another thirty seconds to, to just do that, let's make sure that that works. But um, otherwise, we'll see everybody else uh, in five minutes, which is um, about fourteen oh six according to my 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 clock. So um, see you all shortly. Thank you very much. Andy and Brian, I don't know if you can still hear me, but thank you very much, Jensen. We'll um, yeah. speak soon. We can indeed, Baden, and thank you for joining us from your uh, your, your uh, vacation, I think it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave the mics open if anyone wants to raise a question while we're having a comfort break at all. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of chat, as I say, about well-to-wheel -well factors. Ian, uh, Ian Waller, um, absolutely right. There's, this is a key area. And uh, as ever, I think transport is doing the heavy lifting on trying to work the details on uh, on well to wheel issues. Uh, and it's a, it's an active area of low CBP work. Uh, Gloria is leading on some of our work on that space. Yeah, got you, David. That's we've got your headline slide. Perfect. Right. I will um, I will disappear myself for a few moments. Back in a minute.
Okay, Brian here, I'm back. No, we're not quite at my 14.06 yet though. Okay, it's 14.06. Do we want to restart? Andy, are you back? Yep, let's uh, let's carry straight on. Uh, uh, just looking at the participants, there's still 86 uh, right. in there, so let's let's carry right. on. Okay, so David. Caught me eating my lunch, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, a comfort <laughs> break, not a full-on lunch break. <laughs> I only get five minutes in a day these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks um, very much for um, this arranging this uh, session. It's been very interesting so far. I hope this bit will be interesting as well. Um, so we've been hearing about the source of energy. One of the things about uh, uh, trying to decarbonize freight is that it's a very very important to minimize energy losses as well, make vehicles as efficient as possible. And so that's what this project is about, trying to make vehicles as efficient as possible. And uh, the focus was on building uh, an aerodynamic and lightweight double deck trailer. Um, so the main objectives were to design and manufacture uh, the trailers to operate them and then to evaluate them. And the project partners were Lawrence David and SDC, who together built the trailer bodies and chassis. And Tesco was the uh, uh, operator and the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight um, in Cambridge University was also uh, a key partner. That's where I'm from. And actually, the person that did the data analysis on this project also did all the data work on the previous project that Vaden presented uh, uh, on post-talk. Um, we built six different vehicles, uh, two aerodynamic, two lightweight, and two combined aerodynamic and lightweight trailers. Uh, all the vehicles were pulled by the same tractor units, standard Tesco diesel tractor units. And the key innovations that we tested were the aerodynamic and lightweight double deck trailers. And also uh, we used um, uh, low profile single trailer tires uh, on these double deck trailers, which is unusual on this particular design. And we were able to make a comparison there as, as well. Uh, and we expected carbon dioxide benefits from aerodynamics and increased payload and indeed from low rolling resistance tires. This is how the vehicles look, and you can see a couple of aerodynamic features uh, on them. First of all, the tapered rear end, uh, which reduces uh, drag and uh, uh, drag at, at, at the back end. Uh, and secondly, uh, a, a new kind of front end with two different features. One is a deflector on the top, which is important because in the Tesco operation, all the tractors have the same height and the deflectors are the same height, whether they run on single deck or double deck trailers. So there's a bit of an issue about airflow over the cab gap and that deflector is designed to deal with that. And there's that vertical fin, which is an unusual device. And what that does is stops cross flow of air through the cab gap. And that significantly reduces uh, uh, drag in crosswinds. All of these features were developed and tested in the wind tunnel um, in the university before being built onto the vehicle. Uh, we had uh, long haul trunking. Tesco were doing about 500 kilometers a day uh, on the motorway. Um, this says typical gross vehicle weight 31 tons. That's not actually true. That's the average 
gross vehicle weight. These vehicles on the whole ran full, 44 tonnes in one direction and empty at about 20 tonnes in the opposite direction. Um, so the average comes out at about 31 tonnes and that data comes from the telematics system which reports on daily average mass. Uh, the fueling infrastructure was depot based. Um, we collected, uh, I'm going to talk about data for two aerodynamic vehicles and the baseline vehicle. Uh, we used uh, daily telematics data, which we collected for five months. Um, there are all kinds of issues around that, which are tricky. Uh, the data sets for the left vehicles and the diesel baseline vehicles were comparable. Uh, however, in these kinds of tests, the driver, the road grade, the wind, the weather condition, the payload, everything is differing. Everything varies at once and you need to try and deal with that. We developed a new technique for analyzing um, uh, telematics data in this project, a multiple linear regression approach, and that enabled us to uh, get some quite good mileage out of otherwise difficult data, the telematics data, which is generally not all that useful for this purpose. So this is the approach, the multiple linear regression, regression approach. We took all the data from the various each of the vehicles. We fitted a model, a linear model, which took account on the left-hand side of the fuel in terms of liters per kilometer, a bunch of factors where we're able to separate, separate out the effect of weight, speed, driving style, and trailer type. And we're able to essentially fit a function through that. And this is what came out of it. And it all looks terribly complicated, but actually it's not that, that, not that difficult. First of all, we look at the first column here. What we're, we're looking at is fuel consumption on the vertical axis and the weight of the vehicle, average weight on the horizontal axis. And what we're seeing there is the mean, the green line is the mean through all of the different data for one of the vehicles, uh, through, through all the different, sorry, for all, for all the data. And then there are 95% confidence intervals uh, based on um, the statistical analysis, and that's the dashed lines. And what we see is that when you have a heavier load, you use more fuel. Uh, and that's pretty obvious, but it's less obvious when you realize that all the fuel data is mixed together with different loads and different speeds, different driving styles, different trailer types, different weather conditions, uh, different road gradients, and so on, all mixed together. And we need to try to separate out the factors. So this shows you how that factor of the vehicle load separates out. Uh, it shows you how the speed separates out. And what it shows is the faster you go, the less fuel you use. And that is uh, not a, an expected conclusion because we all know that when you go faster, you have more aerodynamic drag and therefore you use uh, more fuel. However, there are no other things that happen here. We're in, uh, in mixed drive cycles um, on the highway and uh, in and traffic congestion. And the thing that, that uh, is important here is that when you are in start-stop traffic, you use an enormous amount of fuel, much more fuel used up in traffic congestion than is used by, by uh, uh, um, aerodynamic drag. So what happens here is that if you go faster, actually that means there's less stopping and starting. Uh, we're talking about average speeds of of 60 kilometers an hour going up to 70 kilometers an hour in this picture. That's the average over the day. Uh, and uh, where the vehicle is going faster, that means it's stopping and starting less, and that means it's using less fuel for increasing and uh, its kinetic energy and dumping into its brakes, which is what happens during uh, congestion. The driving style is a factor which we don't have much control over, but it's a factor which is measured by fleet board based uh, largely, I believe, on acceleration and deceleration and driver inputs, braking and um, uh, acceleration inputs. And fleet board gives the driver a score. And this shows you that better drivers use less fuel. Well, we knew that, 
But the important thing is that this analysis has extracted that effect and separated it out so that it doesn't get mixed up with the other effects of load and speed. And finally, here is the aerodynamics. Uh, and what we can see here is that for this particular uh, drive cycle, lots of starting and stopping going on, uh, that the aerodynamic trailer used about 2.5% less fuel uh, on average than the baseline trailer. And that was about what we expected for this kind of drive cycle. And I'll show you why that is in a minute. Now, the other thing we did is, uh, is a bunch of coast down experiments at uh, Myra. Uh, we used their long straight. Uh, and in coast down tests, the reason for doing coast down tests is that we can measure from the test data, we can measure the aerodynamic drag and the rolling resistance. And so we did tests in both directions. And here is some typical data uh, where the vehicle uh, is goes up to speed 80 some kilometers per hour in the southwest direction, then coasts down uh, and then goes back up to speed, goes around the corner uh, and comes back in the opposite direction and does a coast down. And we do coast downs and various speed ranges. And by measuring the deceleration of the vehicle, we can estimate the aerodynamic drag and we can estimate uh, the rolling resistance. And what we're able to show here is that we got 7% reduction in the aerodynamic drag coefficient for the, um, the aerodynamic trailer compared to the baseline trailer. And we also got 10% reduction in result, rolling resistance uh, due to the uh, low profile wide single tires uh, compared to the dual tires. So that's worth, that was worth having. 7% and 10% in these cases, they don't mean 7 and 10% fuel reduction. Uh, broadly, if you're going steady speed on the highway, um, half the fuel consumption is go goes into aerodynamics and half approximately goes into rolling resistance at steady speed. So these things correspond to about a 3% reduction in fuel consumption due to aerodynamic drag and about 5% due to rolling resistance when you're going at steady speed. These coefficients are ones which we use in a model, and uh, we can use those coefficients in our model to work out what would be the benefits of these, um, these changes to the vehicles under other conditions. And so, for example, the two aerodynamic vehicles, um, we measured 2.5% uh, reduction in aerodynamic, in fuel consumption from the telematics data, that was what I just mentioned to you. Uh, when we simulated this vehicle on the low CVP long haul cycle, we calculated a 3% benefit of the same uh, drag reduction. And if we looked at cruising at 84 kilometers an hour, that gave 4.7% uh, benefit. Um, we can use the same model to look at the effect of light weighting. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete the work on the lightweight vehicle for various reasons, but this shows you what we expected to see. Uh, and that's a really very dramatic Im improvement due to uh, two and a half tons we saved on the mass of the vehicle. And that two and a half tons means you can carry more load uh, without changing the fuel consumption. And that corresponds, we expect, Cruising at 84 kilometers an hour, we expect that to give us 15%. And on the long haul drive cycle, we expect to see 14%. Uh, and similarly, with both the aerodynamic and lightweight, we expect to see something of the order of 19% fuel benefit of putting the two things together when cruising at 84 kilometers an hour and 17% on the low CVP cycle. So what you can see here. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to complete the measurements, haven't yet been able to complete the measurements on the lightweight trailer due to some technical problems that will happen. But what you can see is that the benefits of light weighting are really dramatic. Uh, 14, 15% reduction in fuel because you can carry more stuff uh, without having to increase the, uh, the drag or the fuel consumption. So that means that the fuel consumption per tonne kilometer is reduced very substantially. So barriers uh, to more widespread adoption of our technology. 
Well, I've, I've mentioned that we've we had some problems with our lightweight trailer body. Uh, that's being uh, uh, work is continuing on that. That particular technology that was developed in the trial needs further work to make it more effective. And I think the other thing which is worth noting is that it's difficult to measure these small changes in service. Uh, and when you've got all these different things going on, changes of speeds and drivers and, and payloads and um, uh, aerodynamics and road gradient and all those things, when all those things are changing, it's very difficult to measure the effects of the small uh, uh, fact, small factors. Um, what the left trial did for us, of course, is it coalesced the project. It uh, really helped the project partners to uh, commit to this work, and it encouraged us to develop this new data analysis method, which really worked very well at separating out the various factors from the telematics. And that's certainly one of the things that should come out of this and, and perhaps go forward to future left trials is that kind of data analysis method. So, um, Brian, I think that's probably over to you or I can talk about lessons learned now. Yeah, if you do the lessons learned, so when you finish, we'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll be done. I'll then okay. share my screen. So what are the lessons learned? Well, I think I just mentioned the new analysis method is very effective for separating out the various factors from telematics data these different things, load, speed, driver, aerodynamics. Um, we did have a lot of difficulty with the logistics of trailer testing. Uh, and the reasons for that are pretty simple. That in the Tesco operation, tractors and trailers uh, are never coupled together for more than one journey. Uh, that means that if you want to know the fuel consumption benefit of a trailer, you have to track every tractor in the fleet in order to work out when it was pulling that particular trailer. Uh, and that is challenging, uh, a little bit challenging. It's not, not too difficult. It becomes particularly difficult if the telematics system only just gives you a summary of what goes on every day uh, rather than what goes on from minute to minute or hour to hour or GPS coordinate to GPS coordinate. So the combination of testing trailers on systems with, of low fidelity telematics data we found very challenging and it caused caused um, a, a, a lot of difficulties with the project and we we were able to work around it in the end but it's much more complicated than we uh, than we expected uh, suggestions for the organizers of future trials um, I think that it is the case that telematics data itself has limited use um, it's much better to correct collect higher resolution, higher frequency data whenever we can. And whenever we do that, we get much more powerful uh, results. The other thing I would say is that electricity charging infrastructure is, which has got nothing to do with the projects which I've talked about, but uh, electricity charging infrastructure is a key component of freight decarbonization. Infrastructure was um, not included in this current left trial. Uh, it should be included in the next one because it's very important that we do a whole lot of work around uh, charging infrastructure for electrification. So that's all I have to say. Over to you, Brian. OK, thanks, Dan. If you want to stop sharing your screen and I'll um, work out how to share mine again. All right, there you go. OK, that should be that. Uh, and if I click on that, hopefully you can now see a slide with emissions testing on it yep no problem great lovely and now i just need to hold on a second put that over there where i can see you right um so um a uh, bit more simple this uh, in this case uh, with the technology um tested over the same test cycles on the test track at 60 percent payload so no dyno testing um no point testing a aerodynamic device on a indoor dyno um so uh test track test track only 60 percent same cycles um, uh, obviously using the same tractor unit throughout, so we're only looking at variations in uh, the uh, trailer uh, and its payload and whether it's um, aerodynamic or not. Um, but because, uh, as uh, uh, David said, we're only looking at potentially quite small improvements in uh, in fuel economy, uh, we wouldn't, and not changing the, the basic diesel engine at, at all, uh, we wouldn't expect uh, any significant air quality changes, positive or negative, um, so we only actually measured uh, diesel 
fuel consumption via an accurate fuel flow um, uh, device. Uh, and also, as Dave said, the, the lightweight technology uh, for technical reasons wasn't available. Um, we didn't know at the time of doing the testing that it wouldn't be available at all through the trial. So we um, we took a, a bit of a finger in the wind um, with uh, David and his team's um, agreement uh, that two tonnes was probably a, a sort of reasonable target to aim for. Uh, so we simply simulated the effects of a two tonnes lighter trailer by taking two tonnes of load out, out of it and, and measuring the fuel consumption in that way. Uh, so in this respect, our testing has only looked at the effects on the vehicle on fuel consumption of taking two tonnes off. So in terms of uh, you know, operating at 33 tonnes, uh, operating instead at 31 tonnes, it hasn't looked, as, as David has just simulated, at the sort of logistical improvements. Uh, clearly, if a two tonne weight saving gives you a 10% extra payload carrying capacity, you can carry 22 tonnes instead of 20 tonnes, for example, um, then that would translate into a 10% overall a sort of trip reduction and therefore a 10% overall uh, operational fuel saving. We, we weren't looking at that, we were just looking at the effect of weight itself in this context. Uh, so on to the results, uh, two sets, two technologies, um, the aero and the lightweight or simulated lightweight uh, and of course there's a third sort of technology which is the, the two combined um, uh, and essentially as, as you would expect and, it, and very much in line with David's um, simulation results uh, the aero gives you a, a, a small but measurable benefit in the, the long haul and regional type cycles, uh, as you would expect, uh, no benefit at all in the, um, uh, the lower speed stuff where aerodynamics isn't uh, anywhere near as important. Um, but light weighting, as you also would expect, um, has, if anything, the, 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 something, the opposite effect in that it's more important at the low speed stuff, gives you a bigger saving there where aerodynamics doesn't dominate. Uh, but even even in the long haul and high speed stuff, you still get a small benefit by, from taking, in this case, uh, two tons uh, off off the load. Uh, and combining those together, which you can do, I haven't done that separately, but if you just compare these two tables together, that would effectively give you the same the same answer. Or you just add these percentages up, effectively, effectively um, means a kind of a five to seven percent saving um, uh, in the, the combination. Uh, as as David says, any, anything you can get to. Um, and it fits in nicely with Tesco's, of course, so every little helps. So um, making your vehicles um, more fuel efficient, in this case through light weighting and aerodynamics, uh, is clearly a, a, a good thing to do um, uh, if it's uh, cost effective. Um, and uh, and this just really summarises what uh, what I've just said. Long haul, uh, obviously good for aero, uh, urban city, best for light weighting. And if you can do both, uh, you've kind of got the best of, best of both worlds covered. Uh, and that's it from uh, from me. So back to uh, any questions for David, Andy, anything coming out of the chat you want to? Uh, I think there was, there was a question about the uh, aero uh, modifications and whether they created any susceptibility to uh, crosswinds, uh, particularly in in, uh, in lightweight um, operations at all, David. Um, I don't know whether you, you've got any very brief comments on that. And nothing reported on that, okay. Andy. I, I think it's certainly no worse than the existing vehicles, uh, probably better, uh, but we don't have any any information reported back. Okay, excellent. Thank you, David. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll keep trying to monitor the uh, the chat and things, uh, but let's get straight on to uh, Yulemko and Amanda, uh, which I think, again, will be a very interesting um, uh, feedback and, and is going to raise some questions, certainly. So, Amanda, please. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. OK, thanks, Andy and Brian. Um, so our project High Time uh, involved the conversion of standard diesel vehicles to run on hydrogen dual fuel. That involves us uh, fitting with hydrogen cylinders, 350 bar, um, and injecting hydrogen into the engine using a calibration system that enables us to optimise the hydrogen to make sure that uh, we, we can meet uh, air quality emissions and uh, convenient usage. Um, the pictures that you see are the range, and this is one of the things that we wish to highlight in the project, that we did a range of vans and uh, urban trucks, um, which uh, particularly important as well to focus on urban for two reasons. One, um, we we trying to do hydrogen refueling uh, uh, in 
across the UK at the moment using existing systems uh, lends itself to doing urban movements on clusters, um, but also urban is where we, we want to demonstrate and provide a quality benefit in the most um, uh, effective way. So next slide. Oh, just before you move to that, the project did include, uh, in the middle you can see the picture of the bespoke hydrogen fueling station that was installed at the Veolia site, the waste site in this project, and that was included in part of our work package to actually install uh, that system. That's the first time that had ever been done by the supplier. Um, okay, next slide. So um, the summary of our objectives were that, you know, we want we wanted to, the partners wanted to get real world uh, use data and to look at how hydrogen could contribute to decarbonising a range of commercial vehicle duty cycles and uses. Um, it involved us doing the physical conversions of, conversions of which uh, all of them apart from the transit and the Merkaconic had not been done before. So they were the first time we demonstrated the range of makes of vehicles and types that we could do. Um, the, the controlled emission studies data was really important to us because um, as an SME, uh, we've tested the technology, we understand what the NOx implications in particular would be for hydrogen in the combustion system, but actually being able to get at um, data from the controlled studies to make sure that our calibrations were uh, doing what we wanted them to do is really essential. And um, there's some learning about that in a in a process, I guess, all these years later, all this time later, I suspect the heartache that that took has probably been forgotten. Um, and um, the refueler station, as you can see, we had a diverse range of partners um, across the country from as far afield as Aberdeen and down in Westminster. And uh, as I explained, the vehicle mixes that we, we looked at uh, two different types of refuse truck. And it's important to point out that those Dennis Eagles were actually Euro 5s and had been on the Veolia fleet for nearly seven, seven or eight years. So um, they were well into their life of use. Um, and what we were trying to look at uh, was the different duty cycles all of these vehicles would be doing, particularly based in urban routes. So we're not really interested at this stage for these types of vehicles on long haul uh, cycles. Next slide, please. Um, we incorporate in our system a way of uh, reading CAN database messages. Um, that's part of the technology, but we also in this trial used an online data uh, system, NetVita, that we've developed to specifically enable us to look at hydrogen use and all the different things that were required to be monitored, uh, which actually gave quite a complex set of data um, that um, we're used to analysing, but uh, I think we found that other other users, uh, uh, the TRL guys did struggle to be able to analyse in the way it was. Um, so, uh, um, and the other thing to point out is um, the transit uh, version, um, we, we talk about being get data to CAN data access. In the transit, we actually have a bit more than that because we have information and work and support from Ford to help us understand uh, more about the base vehicle. So um, you'll see later, I think I mention it, that, you know, the Ford vehicles, and, and Brian will show it, uh, show the greater displacement rate. All the rest of the vehicles we use in our supervisory ECU approach, um, which relies on um, sort of very limited messages. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, one of the things we can demonstrate in this technology is the, with a little bit of extra help from from CAN data, we can actually increase the displacement rate and still deliver the the benefits that will come from the technology. Um, the other thing that we asked about the question about comparability of real real use data, the challenge that we had actually, uh, because of the unreliability of the hydrogen supply in the projects, we originally intended to uh, have the vehicles running for 12 months, we'd have had periods of time when they were in diesel only and then be able to work in dual fuel. Um, we had 
such appalling unreliability that the the you know the data just couldn't couldn't cope with direct comparisons from the base vehicle uh, but also in the data that we did have um the TRL guy spotted that you know if a, if the hydrogen runs out on a particular day's data set it will return to diesel and therefore that particular day's data is skewed depending on you know the percentage that was actually working when the hydrogen was on and we've looked at some of the data to look at variability between the diesel mode speed and the dual fuel mode speed and because the diesel was running out when they were returning back to base which is when the vehicle is run faster then again it may not have uh, direct comparability in trial use next slide all right there we go um, so the headlines were, um, we did manage to get um, over six, nearly 60,000 kilometres completed across the vehicles in dual fuel. Um, that's related to uh, one point, just over 1.5 tonnes of hydrogen having been used. Um, the vehicle di displacement rates in real world varied from as little as 10%, but that was only really for one of the, the, the Dennis Eagle for an initial point, um, up to 45%, um, 46%. And then obviously, uh, Brian will, will look at the controlled studies, but emphasise the difference between the transit van, which has a much better uh, access to the CAN data to alter the hydrogen. The biggest single issue we suffered from was 80% uh, of the reason for the vehicles not running on hydrogen was for the lack of the refueling infrastructure. You can see on the right hand side, um, uh, the, the hydrogen used was heavily skewed by the three vehicles operating in Aberdeen, which are frankly the most reliable station almost in Europe uh, versus the others that uh, for a number of reasons struggled to get access. The last two, the, the Sprinter van, effectively um, London Fire Brigade took a long time to get the vehicle ordered and they had less than two months of the actual time in the trial where we could actually even doing anything with them. They also, uh, so, so that the data at the bottom half, frankly, you know, doesn't really relate. But what was interesting was the, the emissions data from the Millbrook tests on those vehicles. Um, very important point about well to wheel for hydrogen that Andy has alluded to. Every single hydrogen station in the UK that supplies hydrogen for vehicle use um, is green hydrogen. Um, 96% of the volume of hydrogen we used in this trial was actually even on-site generated hydrogen. Um, and um, there is no, it, no, no, none of the industry is using steam methane reform generated hydrogen. That's what's used in chemical production. And it isn't relevant to compare for any uh, of, of the vehicle assessment. So um, on, on our use trial data, specifically looking at the stations in Aberdeen, the station in Sheffield um, uh, that did the largest proportion, plus the Dennis, the one at Veolia, et cetera, et cetera, they're all uh, green and renewable tariffed um, hydrogen production. And as a consequence, even though we had such a limited uh, uh, runtime period um, with the hydrogen in most of the locations, we still saved 14 tonnes of CO2 on that premise. Next slide. OK, that's me. Thank you, uh, Amanda. I'll come back uh, to Amanda in a, in a moment when I've uh, gone through my uh, uh, testing uh, uh, results. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is a, sli a slightly c confusing. Essentially, this is one technology. It's dual fuel, uh, hydrogen and diesel combustion technology. Um, but because this it's applied, as Amanda uh, says, across um, uh, quite a large range of usage applications, um, I, I've, I've uh, treated this as three separate technologies in terms of vans, 
uh, what they've called HGVs in that they are over three and a half tonnes gross weight, so they're N2 category vehicles uh, rather than N1, which are vans. Uh, but essentially, uh, these are the sprinters, if I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Amanda. Um, so they are effectively just large vans, but they're, um, uh, they're classed as HGVs. So I've tra treated that separately. Uh, and then, as uh, Amanda mentioned, the RCVs. Uh, we were not able to test, to test. we did consider it out of scope at the, uh, the start of this project. Uh, the road sweepers, uh, largely because a, a test cycle for those um, was not readily available uh, and there wasn't the, the budget all the time to, to develop one. Um, so road sweepers have not been tested um, independently uh, here. Um, we did, however, have an off-the-shelf um, uh, test cycle for refuse collection vehicles, which we developed uh, a few years ago with uh, TFL help. Thank you, TFL, if you're on the line. Uh, and that does include bin lifting and compaction, so it's a, a, a represent, broadly represented test cycle um, for uh, UK um, RCV operations, um, perhaps with a, a, a nod more towards uh, uh, London type operations. Uh, and of course the vans and HVs were tested over our standard cycles, uh, but because we're vans and we're sub three and a half tonnes, they have different speed limits and different fitment of speed limiters, if indeed any fitment at all of speed limiters. Um, so the cycles were modified slightly for the vans to allow in the, in the high speed cycles to allow for those uh, slightly uh, higher maximum speeds. Uh, and again, all, all testing for this was on 60% uh, payload on the test track uh, because uh, again, we weren't able to test on the dyno uh, indoors within Millbrook's facility uh, for uh, complex insurance reasons, which I won't go into, but uh, again, those will uh, disappear uh, with Millbrook's new facility, I'm assured. Uh, so hydrogen vehicles will be able to be tested at Millbrook in future. Right, so uh, moving on. So the fuel and energy, uh, again, as uh, Amanda alluded to from the in-service trials, all the indications are these are whilst there's a mix of colours in terms of a bit of green, a bit of orange and a bit of, bit of grey. Uh, overall, these are all within plus or minus 6% uh, in terms of overall energy. Uh, and again, this is this dual fuel, remember. So this is this is the uh, uh, hydrogen kilograms per 100 kilometre consumption uh, from these two vans that were tested uh, and this is the uh, diesel litres per 100 kilometres from the, from the same vehicles and there's two numbers because there's two different vehicles. Um, I've separated out, not so so um, apparent for the fuel and energy, but I've separated the Euro 6 and the Euro 5 refuse collection vehicles. Uh, the reasons for doing that will become apparent, particularly when, we, of course, we look at the air quality pollutant emissions in a couple of slides time. Um, but overall conclusion here is uh, that the, there's no uh, great energy penalty. The, um, you can and substitute quite a lot of diesel, uh, you know, quite a wide range, as uh, Amanda alluded to. 60% was the best case, and that's with the, the, the Ford. Uh, uh, transit that uh, Amanda's mentioned, 15% uh, was more likely for the for the RCVs, for the lower displacement, but you can um, you can inject a lot of hydrogen uh, to displace a lot of diesel or you know, a small mass of hydrogen, of course, to displace a, a quite a large proportion of diesel um, through this uh, technology as the key, the key finding in, in regards of fuel and energy use at least. Now, greenhouse gas emissions is where it clearly gets more complicated. Uh, clearly, burning hydrogen only produces, uh, well, it doesn't only produce, but uh, essentially uh, only produces uh, water vapour. Might be a, a, a bit of other pollutant emissions as well, which we'll come on to in the next slide. Um, but essentially, water vapour, so the tailpipe CO2 is uniformly green. Um, with those displacements of, of, of diesel, that means you're burning a lot less diesel and, and therefore inevitably producing a lot less tailpipe CO2. So that's uh, uniformly positive. Um, now, there isn't a well-to-wheel standard factor for hydrogen currently published by uh, Bayes or DEFRA. So Low CVP did some work uh, back end of last year to try to develop uh, a factor. If, if there was one, what would it look like? Um, and uh, these are based, as with all those standard factors, they're, they're economy-wide factors. So they don't consider the end-use application. So it was one factor for gas, whether you're putting gas into a truck or a van or a boiler or a power station, uh, doesn't matter, it's one factor. Uh, and, and we followed the same approach for hydrogen to try and develop a standard factor. Um, and whilst Amanda's absolutely right, hydrogen isn't used. The dominant source of hydrogen in transport is not the same as the dominant source of hydrogen across the economy. Um, for, for a life for life comparison on standard factors, we, we've used the economy wide default which is steam methane reformation of, of natural gas. Uh, and if you use that sort of factor, uh, you actually end up with uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions being higher 
uh, for these uh, vehicles than for um, the, the diesel vehicles. Um, but uh, again, fully in line with what uh, Amanda has, has just said, if you redo those calculations um, based on a more realistic um, analysis of what's actually going on in the transport sector uh, at the moment, and what uh, clearly makes a lot more sense from a from a um, we need to be net zero by 2050 kind of philosophy. Uh, we don't need to be steam methane reforming natural gas anymore. Well, at least not without CCS. Uh, we need to be doing something uh, somewhat radically different. Uh, the somewhat radically different thing we can do is use electrolyzers with uh, renewable electricity. In this case, this is um, not directly wired in renewable electricity. So this is not directly wired into its its own wind turbine. This is um, taking uh, grid electricity, but then certifying it as 100% renewable tariff uh, in the same way as the biomethane that Daniel and uh, uh, Baden were talking about earlier uh, is in effect um, uh, grid certified biomethane. Um, uh, it's injected somewhere else and taken out at the point of point of use. Applying the same philosophy for an on-site hydrogen electrolyzer using renewable electricity, uh, then of course you, you then get much lower uh, factors in, in here. Uh, and those um, you know, kind of 10 to 30% um, uh, disbenefits uh, turn into 10 to 35% positive benefits. So, so absolutely, yes, greenhouse gas savings with green hydrogen are, are achievable. It's the key headline uh, positive finding from, from this uh, analysis. And going on to pollutant emissions, uh, again, as with the other cases, the methane vehicles, these are uh, hydrogen dual fuel, of course, but a similar overall picture in terms of there's a bit of orange, a bit of grey and, and a bit of green. Uh, yes, the, the green are in, the, in, in good places. So green with NOx is in the city centre type operations, which is where, of course, uh, NOx is, is most important. Um, uh, but on the on the other side of the ledger, uh, those those greens tend to be accompanied by some oranges somewhere along the line, whether that's higher particulate number emissions or higher carbon monoxide emissions or, or in some cases uh, a bit of both. Um, you know, again, horses for courses, a uh, little to choose. I, I'll just point out the, um, the, the refuse collection vehicles as they we have a Euro 6 and a Euro 5. Um, this gives you some indication of the value of moving from Euro 5 to Euro 6 as quickly as possible and why we have things like clean air zones uh, in operation. Uh, we've gone from 42 grams per kilometre um, to you know, less than two grams per kilometre uh, in the transition from Euro 5 to Euro 6 and, and similar for the uh, for the for the left vehicles here and and same with sort of orders of savings for a particular number. Right back to Amanda, thank you. Thanks Brian. Um, so obviously we get data from private, one of the most important things with hydrogen is to make people understand that it's safe. So it was really gratifying that uh, none of those issues came out from testing with the drivers. Uh, there was also a bit of analysis about looking at operational cost. The reality is the operational cost is highly dependent on the price of hydrogen. So it's really important that the hydrogen is provided at a scale that can be competitive to diesel. I'll come back to that. Um, the reality is by using a hydrogen dual fuel vehicle, the vehicles can fit into daily operation. Um, and if it wasn't for the lack of reliability of stations, um, then uh, you know we would have done a, a lot better. But equally, by being able to revert to dual fuel these uh, to diesel these vehicles, were actually able to do the duties that the operators required them to do. There was a specific issue that we had where Acardo joined the project with the hope that they could um, uh, be part of the weight derogation that was negotiated with the EU, which uh, uh, came back uh, not allowing that and therefore that uh, on hydrogen dual fuel it seems bizarre to us that 100% CNG uh, vehicles are allowed to have more uh, increased weight at the 3.5 tonne however the EU uh, did not accept the argument that the dual fuel will decarbonise in the way that we've just described and therefore our, our cargo had to manually intervene and it limited the the, ve the routes that they could use the vehicle on um, for their deliveries. Um, I, I wanted to make the point about the trial findings. I think um, uh, Brian noted the CO particulate, or certainly the CO figures. Um, as I explained, this was the first data that we had giving the full emission test. Um, the, this technology was the first time we put on most of these vehicles. 
Um, having been given the information, we were able to calibrate out um, the CO uh, or, the, or the rich burn occasions which had generated the increased CO situa uh, scenario. And we were also in, uh, certainly in the Merkur-Connex, uh, carried on doing uh, calibration work that has now got those Merkur-Connex operating over 30% displacement, whereas I think the data um, uh, it doesn't come out obviously because it was amalgamated together, but it was less than that when we actually did the tests at Millbrook. Um, the reality is, what's the key learning? We need hydrogen uh, refueling um, stations uh, at scale to be able to to do uh, to make the most of this technology. Um, and we would also point out that. Um, the hydrogen uh, using renewable hydrogen into these vehicles, particularly given the nature of the breadth and type of vehicles we, we, we are doing it for, this is a really effective way to deliver the kind of greenhouse gas savings that the trial has illustrated. Um, uh, yet to date, I think uh, none of none of our uh, hydrogen combustion technology through policy support has has been allowed to participate in any of the support programs for hydrogen H2 mobility high tap um, specifically in, excluded the hydrogen dual fuel technology from those projects. Um, so that's a big barrier for us because not only does it try and indicate that the technology isn't viable, but it also doesn't help provide support. Um, what would we learn um, uh, going forward? Um, the you know the fact is drivers are comfortable with it we can provide a cost effective solution uh, one of the other things we've done since the project um, Aberdeen have deployed two more sweepers the second of which is actually coming from new where we're collaborating with Johnson sweepers and able to put more hydrogen on board this actually means we can push that sweeper up to nearly 40 percent displacement where in the trial we had to limit it because to be convenient for its duty cycle, it was running out on the third day anyway. Um, we're also operating the PTO from that as well, because again, that's energy on board that we can operate and therefore we will provide the same energy benefit for, for the PTO and, and any of the uh, onboard energy systems. Um, the Dennis Eagles were not not appropriate for us to do. They were they were old and therefore off the road a bit more. Um, I think the final sort of message we wanted to to do, which I think has come out of some of the discussions about the biogas and biomethane option, the fact is vehicles aren't disconnected from energy infrastructure, and therefore, if you're going to do uh, trials for decarbonised vehicles, you need to. Be mindful of including how the infrastructure is supplied and how we get uh, the vehicles fueled. Um, if if you were to do a scaled trial next of say 500 kilos around a location, the beauty of our technology is it can be it can be designed to match with the renewable generation requirement. The operators don't need a guarantee, and we can make sure that we could use every kilo of the hydrogen that could be made. And if you do it about 500 kilos at a site, which would in our case possibly be uh, 100 refuse truck type cycles um, in, a, in a location, you would you would achieve the, the best benefit from from the technology. I think that's my last slide, isn't it, Brian? Yes, thank, thank you, Andy, Amanda. Uh, it's Andy Eastlake. Um, uh, please fire questions in via the chat. Brian, can we just flick over to uh, Marcus's slides, um, because I think um, before before we do a little bit of low CVP wrap up, um, I wanted Marcus uh, Jones from TRL just to give us a bit of an impression, because I think for this community, understanding how to run effective trials is also a key message. Um, so I wanted to give Marcus the last couple of minutes just to uh, to, to give us a little bit of a, an insight into how they found trying to monitor the vehicles and uh, uh, what went well, what for, what can be improved. Marcus. OK, hello. Thank, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for organising this. Um, yes, so just quickly as possible, I wanted to run through the um, first what we felt were the successes, and this is with a focus on the, the monitoring side of it, and then lessons learned. So um, 
First and foremost, I think the combination of having both the laboratory, so the Millbrook trials, alongside in fleet trials was really helpful and added value compared with doing one or other separately because it meant that all duty cycles were considered and that there was a comparable trial versus baseline data for all the projects, even when operational factors meant that it was quite difficult in some cases to get that in the fleet trial. Um, I think a second point, and I think this is you know, noted by some of the, the, pr the presentations previously, the, the data and experience gained from this has clearly helped the more experimental technologies um, to, to raise their technology readiness levels, um, as Amanda was describing, in fact, how, how you've used the Millbrook trial results to improve the calibration of, of your vehicles. Um, also, and I think a message from several of the presentations has been that, and although it was not a focus of the monitoring side of the, the programme, was that the fuel supply chain, especially of renewables, has been developed and the investment from this programme has, has supported that. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something that, that does require further focus. Overall, there's a number of lessons learned for, um, that we as the monitoring contractor um, and also a number of the participants in terms of future trials. And I think a point already made before, um, there was very wide range of different technologies across the program, the eight different projects. Um, also, they were at different technology readiness levels. So the you know with the the gas vehicles have already been in fleet operation for for a number of years, um, even though the okay the more recent technologies improved. Um, but then there were other technologies where there was development being being you know under undertaken throughout the program. Um, secondly, and I think a point that that needs to be to, to be considered in in how monitoring is undertaken, is that the different projects had often quite different trial objectives in addition to demonstrating fuel and efficiency savings and the monitoring program and hence the data that was collected by TRL as a monitoring tractor didn't necessarily provide that focus and part of that is and a point that, that, that has been made in earlier presentations um, more focus is needed on the really the free fueling infrastructure so that um, you know more data is collected on that because that that is actually key to it so for future programs, I think we'd suggest that you need more project specific indicators and you know, more project specific data collection and analysis methods that needs to be defined at the start of the program when the pro individual projects are funded. There was um, an, a, an assumption that in some ways one size fits all, that was, that was, that was perhaps naive. And so a very similar standardised approach was originally proposed for each of the different, the different projects and the different technologies and you know, something more sophisticated is needed. Um, noting um, what uh, David Seaborn was saying, um, actually there are more sophisticated analysis techniques um, that, that can be applied. Um, looking at a wider range of factors, so actually directly using the data on the loading and the speeds, um, in addition to the fuel and distance data that was the focus of what we of what we were doing. In order to do that, you need better quality monitoring data, so more standardization and validation of telematics and potentially um, higher resolution methods used to, to get that data. Perhaps we should be considering a phased approach to the trials so that the um, vehicle operation um, and data collection. So rather than saying, right, everyone starts in the same point, everyone, now we begin trialing, that actually we stage it, we, ch we check that the fueling infrastructure is there, we check the vehicles there and, and, and we progress it. And that potentially at the very, very first step is to use the, the control trials um, because that helps, it helps us in several ways. It helps demonstrate the vehicles are operating as intended. It enables us to validate the telematics data and check calibrations, but also to inform the fleet trial design, because once we get data from the control trials on the scale of the impacts, you can start applying statistical methods to your sampling des design um, to ensure that you've got you know, the, the right statistics, the right statistical power from, from your fleet trial. Um, there needs to be stricter control of baseline and trial vehicles. Um, there were a number of operational reasons why that proved difficult in the fleets. Um, but again, with better, better monitoring data and better telematics data, you can you can allow for that to control that better. 
Uh, I think a few a few points that others others have made today. Um, it ideally we would have had better ongoing exchange of data between um, as as we were getting results to the individual projects. Um, you know, not least the complexity of the number of different projects and some delays in getting data to us made that more difficult. But had that been achievable, um, and we'd recommend any future programs, it would have added more, um, you know, more value. And the last point I think is, um, you know, fora like this today that low CVP are organising is a really good opportunity for the different projects to exchange and other stakeholders to to work together and share share experience and lessons learning and you know if they i you know a future program that provided more opportunities for that process ongoing through the program would be advantageous so those very hopefully quickly enough for you there brian were the the, the, the points that, that that i wanted to make on that that's Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. And uh, and we'd like to extend our thanks to TRL for all of the work they've put in over the, the three years on this. Uh, they, they've been a, a sort of silent partner in the back room doing all of the legwork and con contacting the... Uh, um, I, I know we've run out of time. We're losing a few people uh, because of the uh, the timing. So we're, we're very happy to take uh, questions and comments. Um, I think a couple of headlines to take away from this. Uh, we have a follow-up um, webinar for some of the other technologies, the electric vehicles, uh, which is coming up next week at the same time. And I'll try and chair that a little bit better. Um, and I think what we have done is see that uh, there are some good technologies here that we've called evolution technologies that can give us direct benefit savings, the, the aero and the light weighting. They're there, they're available. They really don't need to be proved any further and they should be being adopted. All of the gas vehicles, LNG, uh, I think uh, we've got some great opportunities there. One of the key outcomes from this project has been the awareness and very, very active engagement in the need to look at the fuel source and the well-to-wheel -well impacts. I think that has come through very, very well from this project that the people engaging in this work understand well-to-wheel, -well, understand greenhouse gas savings, and are very focused on it. So it's great to see the, the steps forward between the start of this project and, and what the fuels available and in use are at the end of this project. Um, and taking that message forward, it's fuel, decarbonizing fuel and then using it efficiently in vehicles is the focus. Uh, and then I think we've also seen, uh, we, we, we will see a bit more about some of the electric vehicles next week. Um, and I think Amanda touched on the fact that the, uh, the, the hydrogen dual fuel straddles between the city centre and the long haul. There's a clear benefit in the long haul sector, which is where 75% of the fuel is used in, in trucking, um, where a low carbon fuel directly into that sector can decarbonise it very rapidly, uh, where perhaps electricity can't do so just at the moment. Um, uh, questions coming through. We will share the slides from this. We'll make those available uh, as well. And as I mentioned, there will be a report coming out uh, in September time frame um, uh, pending Innovate writing us the purchase order for that. Um, the next webinar is next week, but please, any questions, any emails, uh, send them through to myself and Brian here at the Low CVP. Um, I'm, I will. I'll keep keep the the, the event running. Um, so uh, Anna's picked up on the uh, potential greenhouse gas savings of biomethane. Uh, is government uh, open to considering this fuel as a potential solution for decarbonising freight? So that's exactly the messages we're taking in. And uh, I know Matt Edwards and others from government, Rob Evans, are on or have been on through throughout today, and we will be discussing the opportunities for. Uh, renewable fuels into the, uh, the the heavy fleet as being a key uh, a, a, a key component in the near and medium term decarbonisation. Um, any other questions or queries? Uh, anyone want to open their mic and shout at us uh, and berate me for chairing it badly at all and timing? Good Lord, nobody's, nobody's, uh, no, oh, we've got, uh, we've got a hand up there. Hand up Anna, the, oh, the, sorry, please, please, yeah. So, uh, Ian Waller, yeah. Just, just to say, Andy, uh, well done. Uh, you know, this is the, exactly the kind of thing that Low CVP should be doing, uh, pulling together 
long-term studies that are doing benchmarking, collating data on large field trials, making sure it's handled consistently and finding ways of making sure data is disseminated so that it's it's validated with uh, with people like you, the audience you've got today. Uh, this, this, is, this is exactly the reason why the low CVP was created. So well done. Thank you, Ian. That's very good. And thank you for all your contributions on the chat. Uh, and hopefully I answered some of them. But uh, lots lots more work to follow in, in a number of these areas. Um, thanks, thanks, Ian. David, uh, Dave Spivy. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, just um, one thing I noted. Um, there's the comment that in the transportation um, provision of hydrogen, it's all essentially green hydrogen electrolysis derived. Um, a lot of the attention in, I think, in the transport decarbonisation plan, but also certainly in the net zero 2050 um, perspective from BICE, is very much that hydrogen is going to be coming in the future from SMR and, and CCS type derivation, which is different. And it just surprised me. There seems to be a different perspective there. Do you understand why that is? Uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a very good question. And um, we certainly see a role for hydrogen, and that has to be uh, low carbon or decarbonized hydrogen. Uh, obviously, there are two routes. There's the uh, uh, renewable green electrolysis uh, pathway or the blue uh, SMRCCS. Um, I think that actually extends beyond where low CVP ex expertise probably uh, reside. Um, and I think it's uh, that that's going to be a slightly bigger issue than just a transport uh, a transport activity. What we're trying to do is to uh, create um, a space where that debate can be had uh, in a, in a very um, impartial and neutral way. Um, I think that you know our immediate concern is uh, unless you have got a low carbon form of hydrogen, uh, you're not actually benefiting uh, transport by putting hydrogen into vehicles. However, a key point of this is that the, the, the pathway for hydrogen, the decarbonisation pathway, is incredibly rapid uh, along the same lines of electricity. So reflecting a hydrogen vehicle on today's hydrogen footprint is not necessarily the right way of considering it. So um, I, I, I personally, uh, my CCS isn't proven at scale yet, um, but there's m more money announced today, in fact, I think, uh, or yesterday to uh, to support that. So it's clearly on the agenda. Uh, uh, I know Ellie Davis was on and uh, her work at the CCC uh, previously, prior to her, her joining the DFT, she may have a better comment on um, the CCC's thinking about uh, hydrogen pathways. Uh, are you still there, Ellie, at all? I think she's disappeared. So I'm not sure that answered the question, Dave, but um, uh, it's, it's definitely an active area for us to focus on in terms of hydrogen pathways. No, thanks for that, Andy. I mean, I appreciate that. And it'd be worth following up and just making sure that that is um, correctly bottomed out in defining future policy at the DFT. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Brian, Brian yeah, I think, I mean, clearly in the short term, I think this, this is perhaps a, a timing issue. In that you're absolutely right. The, the CCC particularly are focused on or assuming that a widespread use of hydrogen would tend to come from um, SMR with CCS as the, as the most um, scalable and, and cost effective uh, solution e economy wide, um, but in the short term, clearly we don't have um, blue hydrogen. Is that we we don't have um, um, hydrogen from SMR with CCS uh, readily available. So those wanting uh, to to trial and demonstrate and use hydrogen vehicles um, have got to do something else to to decarbonise that that hydrogen. Uh, and there's something else immediately available in the short term is is the electrolysis with with renewable electricity. So uh, so that probably explains the difference. But I absolutely agree with you that the you know uh, one one may not be the the long term answer, and um, and and both need um, further support anyway to um uh, to allow that um, uh, VHS beta max type um. um uh, battle to, uh, to resume properly. Just, I'm not just, sure I completely agree with with all of that, Brian, because I think the the, the issue with the SMR derived hydrogen, even with CCS, is that it's got a higher carbon footprint potentially than the electrolytically yeah. derived. Yeah, I think I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I think I think that the key thing is to uh, to get some real data on these things. Um, and of course, uh, both electrolyzer efficiency, fuel cell efficiency, uh, you know, combustion hydrogen engine efficiency, and CCS are all changing and developing rapidly. So it's a it's a slightly moving uh, set of goalposts. Um, but uh, low CVP is actively stepping into the hydrogen space 
uh, and we've got a, a working group uh, kicking off. Gloria's leading on some work uh, through August and the back end of this year for us to try to get to grips with it a bit better than we have in the past uh, and to hopefully bring that same uh, that same level of sort of um, transparency and independence into the hydrogen space, which is a, a, a fairly conflicted area. I'm going to turn to Amanda because she will undoubtedly. So, Amanda, I know you're still there, so please chip in because uh, you've probably got a better idea than I have. Yeah, Andy, thanks. I think uh, you're right to say the thoughts are evolving. So the original, when we when we were talking about 80% decarbonisation, the CCC did talk about hydrogen, but in a very limited sense. In the net zero published report, it talked about possibly about 80% coming from blue, blue sources by the time 2050. The most recent assessment, assessments have said effectively based on if we can prove that we can get electrolysis cost downs that it might be as much as 50 50 that would be into the system by then so it's a it's a very much an evolving story and actually andy it depends what policy and how we choose choose to take advantage of the opportunity far more than what we know about the technology today so um yeah i think you're doing the right thing to have a proper group let's try and make sure that we can focus the interesting point in everything that I've said is the most likely and preferred route for most people involved is to put the green hydrogen into transport rather than um, putting that into into industry and things like that, which is what's been announced today. Thanks, Amanda. Any other questions uh, with the, the open mic session that we're now in, uh, albeit I understand we have extended beyond the original uh, time frame, but uh, happy to, uh, to try and field any comments or thoughts. No other hands going up at the moment. Uh, just, just one from me. I, I, I'm just wondering whether we should um, make next week's uh, webinar two and a half hours rather than two. Perhaps another lesson learned is that um, we can't do four <laughs> projects in two hours. But uh, yeah, I think I think that might we we will we will flag that up. I think um, uh, just as a quick trailer for those that are still left. Uh, I think there's still 40, 40 odd people on. Um, yeah, next week uh, focusing on some uh, uh, electric van programs, delivery operations, uh, and. Uh, uh, some some other sort of um, uh, technologies more suited to the city centre activity uh, to, uh, to 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 combine in with the long haul work that we've done here. Uh, I think, um, and obviously there's a focus there on the city centre emissions. I think another parting comment from this is that uh, throughout this work, um, the evidence has been that the Euro six emissions control is delivering even when we apply different technologies uh, in in into. Uh, uh, into use, whether that be um, uh, compression ignition uh, gas uh, or indeed um, the, the, the hydrogen dual fuel. Euro 6 is doing what it says on the tin and delivering uh, good emissions control across the cycles that uh, that we need to see, which is which is very encouraging. Um, so I think that was a that was a key takeaway from the program too. Um, just picking up uh, anything on the uh, on the chat. Nothing else on the chat. Any other comments from anyone or shall we close the session if everyone's happy? I think that's it. Thank you all very much. The uh, 40 of you that are still left. Thanks very much indeed. Hopefully we'll see many of you next week uh, and, uh, and and have a chance to, uh, to follow up on this. Great stuff. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.